Welcome, bonjour, buenos dias, guten tag, and buongiorno, everyone, to our second career panel within our Meet EU activities. My name is Marcus Thiel. I am an associate professor at Florida International University in Miami, focusing on European politics and international organizations. And I am the Jean Monnet Center um, of Excellence Director, sponsored by the European Union. As part of an EU grant called Getting to Know Europe that we received together with the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Pittsburgh, we will be holding regular career panels, two per semester over the next two years with alumni, European diplomats, CEOs and business chamber representatives, as well as other nonprofit leaders in which we discover and examine various career paths in Europe and the skill needed for those. Today, we'll focus on the importance of languages and keeping up with them. Because if you don't use it, you lose it, as you know. You can probably already tell by my accent that I'm German, um, but I learned English as a second language fairly early on. And then I added French and Spanish as a youth as, a, as, a youth, as elective for work and pleasure. With that, I ended up as a Fulbright exchange student as a grad student in the United States 20 years ago. That significantly improved my English skills, I hope, and it got me to where I am today. In the European Union itself, there are 24 official languages recognized by the 27 member states. And the majority of youth learn at least two foreign languages in school. So language learning is not only important for travel, but also for increasing job skills to work in a transatlantic uh, work context or in European diplomacy. As for our agenda for the next 80, 85 minutes, we asked each of the present panelists to detail a little bit about their position, what language skills are needed, and what opportunities exist for students and young professionals to prepare continuously uh, their language skills in their respective areas. After the presentations, there'll be about 20 to 25 minutes of question and answers. So we welcome your questions. Um, please post them um, through the chat box on the bottom. You can do that at any time. But before we begin, I wanted to thank the European Commission and the European Union delegation in Washington, D.C. for funding our activities, as well as our collaborative partners from the University of Pittsburgh and North Carolina Chapel Hill and our U.S. Jean Monnet network for their good collaboration. Of course, I cannot forget my right hand, Madame Christine Kali, as well as our School of International Public Affairs and Florida International University's career services staff, who were all very helpful in preparing these events. And of course, a special thanks goes to our panelists, which I'll introduce now individually before they speak. We have a great lineup of panelists for you, as you can see here on the slide. And, um, First, uh, Madam, or Miss uh, Senora, to be exact, Lisa Arias Rodriguez will speak. Uh, Miss Rodriguez is an education advisor of the Embassy of Spain at the Consulate General in Miami. She graduated cum laude from Middlebury College, a college with a joint major in Spanish and French. And she holds two master's degrees from the University of Santiago de Compostela in Vigo in Spain in philology and advanced English. After a lifelong career in teaching at all levels, as well as being a professional development specialist, Madame Rodriguez has recently taken a new direction in her career. In September 27, she became an education advisor for the New York office of the Spanish Embassy. At the Embassy, she promotes diverse educational youth outreach programs in the US and Canada with the goal of fostering collaborative educational programs always in the hopes of inspiring and empowering individuals to become global citizens through the passionate process of language learning. She's currently the national coordinator of the NALCAP Spain program that she'll explain to us, I'm sure, in a second. Last but never the least, she's a proud mother of three. With that being said, Senora Rodriguez, it's all yours. Muchas gracias, Marcus. Thank you De for nada. that introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, today I've been asked to give a little bit, talk a little bit about my experience 
um, with language learning. Um, the value of knowing languages and being involved in lifelong learning is of such importance. And they're linked together because when you study a language, you're involved in lifelong learning because you're gonna have to study that language for the rest of your life. Um, proficiency in second language and intercultural competency skills open employment possibilities. Many sectors require increasing involvement in the global economy from international organizations, tourism, to communications and the diplomatic corps. High level, high paying employment demands competence in more than one language. Beyond economics, there are countless advantages that language learning individuals enjoy by being able to communicate with a much wider range of people from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. Knowledge of other languages enriches travel experiences and allows people to experience other societies and cultures in a more meaningful way. Besides access to foreign media, literature, and the arts, people who speak other languages simply connect and converse more freely. It expands your worldview so that you not only know more, but you know differently, and that's very important. I really feel that it's time for all Americans to recognize the vital importance of an American citizenry that can communicate effectively in many languages and across cultures, and for schools to make the teaching and learning of languages a priority in the K through 16 curriculum. This is a necessary first step in moving this country towards parity with nations around the globe that have students who can communicate in more than one language. And Marcus was talking before about Europe, and I'd like to give an example, um, my children, who went to Spain, uh, who went to school in Spain, had to deal with learning four different languages every day in school. They studied Spanish, obviously, as language arts. They studied English as a foreign language from the age of three. Then in the seventh grade, they began studying French as a second foreign language. And in addition to these languages, they studied from the first grade, the regional language, uh, Galician from Galicia, the part of Spain where we are from. So that means they have four different ways of seeing the world. I feel very fortunate to have been born in a family who spoke another language at home. I was born in New York. Uh, the first language that I learned was Spanish because that was the language that was spoken at home. My parents were immigrants from Spain who made sure Spanish was always spoken at home, while at the same time, English was the language to be learned and respected at school and at work. Um, I remember a friend in elementary school whose mother was Cuban and had taught her to speak Spanish at home. But when she got to school because of a methodology that we used back then called tracking, she got placed in a class where she was not able to move forward as quickly as she would have liked or her family. And the school told her mom that this was because of a lack of English skills. Well, they stopped speaking Spanish at home and only spoke English from then on. And it's really a shame that that school community wasn't able to acknowledge and promote my friend's linguistic skills and showcase them. To this day, my friend regrets the decision that they stopped speaking Spanish at home because now she can only speak Spanish. As when I went to high school, I had the opportunity to study French and Italian because my school really felt that it was important to offer a wide range of different languages. I had an amazing French teacher, Ms. Katz, who besides teaching me tons of French language and literature and culture, suggested that I apply to a small and wonderful college in Vermont that had amazing opportunities for students interested in language learning. That was Millbury College, and I went there to college thanks to Ms. Katz. There I majored in Spanish and in French. I spent my junior year in Madrid and in Paris. I studied Portuguese and Italian and opened my mind to many different cultures and experiences. After graduating college, I decided to give it a go in Europe. I said, I'll go to Spain for a year and see what happens, and I stayed forever. I do also want to mention here the importance of heritage learning and uh, the situation I encountered uh, through my education. Because I was a heritage learner, I never had real formal training in written Spanish. 
Spanish. So it wasn't until I got to college that I even learned how to place an accent on words. And as I'm sure you all know, you really need to do this in Spanish. But this was only, thank thankfully, I had a wonderful professor who after class took the time to explain the accents, where to put them and where not to put them. I had told the Spanish department that I wanted an upper level class in Spanish because I had no formal training in the written language. And they placed me in the highest grammar class that they had, which was on the subjunctive. So because I spoke Spanish fluently, I would sound out the subjunctive without really learning anything new. But thankfully that professor did teach me about accents. I know that now wonderful uh, things are being done with heritage learning and it is moving forward. Recently, the Embassy of Spain offered a PD activity um, with um, Harvard professor, Dr. Maria Luisa Barra, for the teachers of Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach school districts, which they got a lot out of that PD activity. I also know that at FIU in the Modern Languages Department, uh, Dr. Marisa Figueras Gomez is working on this. So I think there are gonna be many more options for heritage learning. So when I moved to Spain, I began to teach English and really felt the importance of teaching and learning languages. English is a core subject in all of Europe, and I had the privilege of teaching English at all levels of education. I love teaching and will always, always be a teacher at heart. And now, thanks to knowing languages, I work for the Ministry of Education of Spain through the Embassy of Spain here in the US. It is my dream job where I can apply my knowledge of language learning and the Spanish and American education. And one thing that I'd like to mention is also that a lot of people don't talk about the fact that when we speak about the advantages of learning another language, there's an opportunity there to learn even more about your own language and culture. When we speak, a different language, we see our own language and culture with a different vision and from a different perspective. And this enriches our life experiences, providing a basis for mutual understanding and respect across all cultures. So now I'm going to take a couple of minutes to tell you about our NALCAP program, North American Language and Cultural Assistance Program in Spain. This is a program that will give you an incredible opportunity to immerse yourself in learning about languages and culture. So thank you, Andre, for putting uh, the presentation on the screen. So you can go to the next one because as we see, that is made. This is a, a short video that will give you an overview about the program. So Andre, if you can put the video. Fancy living in Spain? Join the Language and Culture Assistance Program of the Education Office of the Spanish Embassy. It offers a fantastic opportunity to spend a school year in Spain as an assistant teacher, sharing your language and knowledge with Spanish students K through 12 and adults. Con ella aprender inglés es estupendo. Chloe es la mejor. I got medical insurance and a monthly allowance to help pay for accommodation and expenses. And I really think that this experience will help with my career in the future. Spain also offers you amazing travel and cultural possibilities. I couldn't have imagined this was going to be such a, a, a life-changing experience. And what about the food? And the lively streets. And the wonderful people. <laughs> Yo he mejorado mucho mi español. Don't miss this opportunity. Learn more about the Language and Culture Assistance Program of the Education Office of the Embassy of Spain. And grow as you share. Okay, so something about the program. Andre, if you could hit the next. Thank you. NALCAP is an educational outreach initiative of the Ministry of Education of Spain that gives American college students and graduates the opportunity to be teaching assistants in Spain and each and every classroom across the country. Because of the importance of learning English, the Spanish government wants to provide 
um, native speakers, native-like speakers in each and every classroom of Spain. Language assistants will return to the United States with the knowledge of a new language and culture. They can use this knowledge and experience in any path they choose to pursue, whether it be in the field of teaching, of business, or any other. And their time abroad will probably set them apart from the crowd, bringing to the table cross-cultural awareness, maturity, and lots of resilience. And knowing another language will definitely bring an added value to their business. What will they be doing exactly? They'll be a teacher's assistant, working under the guidance and supervision of a teacher in the English as a world or foreign language program at that school. They will be probably conducting conversation lessons because the speaking part, part of their um, tasks will be very, very important so that, it shows, so that students in the classrooms can hear that pronunciation and that intonation and all those other aspects of language learning, of language speaking that is so that comes from a native or a native like speaker. They will be conducting conversation lessons, presenting cultural presentations, and also perhaps attending department meetings. And they may also be involved in extracurricular activities, such as workshops, cultural activities, field trips, sport events, musical performances, or school play. Okay, the program requirements are the following. You have to be a U.S. citizen and have a valid U.S. passport. You have to be a native-like speaker of English. You must have a basic level of Spanish, be a college junior or senior, or be a college graduate, or have an associate degree, or be a community college student in their last semester. You must be in good physical and mental health, have a clean background check, and be aged 18 to 60. So there's a lot of possible language assistance out there. Um, with the permission of the other panelists, I'm going to be a little biased here, and I'm going to say that there's nothing else quite like Spain. It's a beautiful country full of wonderful people, a wonderful language, and wonderful culture. And I hope um, many of you will think about this program. Um, unfortunately, for this year, if we could have the next slide, um, applications closed on Tuesday. But if you would like to start thinking about it, they'll be open again next year and around January. You, if you're interested in more information, you can search for NALCAP Spain. I think, Marcus, you were going to put the link to the website in the, in the chat for us. Thank you so much. And um, if you have any questions, we have an email address there and you can write to us and uh, we hope to see you in Spain. And thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Makes me want to go to Spain. Oh, that's and, what everybody says. Every time we yes. do this presentation, everybody says that, Mark. So thank you, yes. No, no, you're um, welcome. Thank you for, for presenting and for being so inspiring. So we can figure that out. Um, you have the link, I posted you the link to the French uh, language learning program already. Um, but uh, now as a next guest, I'd like to introduce to you um, Mr. Claudio, actually Consul, Honorary Consul Claudio Pastor. Uh, Mr. Pastor is the Executive Director of the Societa Dante Alighieri of Miami. As Executive Director of the Official Italian Language Institute, he provides general oversight of the day-to-day -day operations of one of the premier cultural institutions in the city of uh, Coral Gables, Miami-Dade County. The Societa Dante Alighieri, Miami, is one part of the um, an institution that was founded in 1889 and is headquartered in Rome, Italy. It's the oldest and most prestigious institution for the promotion of the Italian language and culture. In 2005, the Societa Dante Alighieri was recognized with the prestigious uh, Principe de Asturias Award for Culture. Through the personal efforts of Mr. Pastor, the Societa Dante Alighieri has fostered and developed deep ties and collaboration with various European consuls in Miami. And um, he also has been instrumental in the establishment of branches of um, the Institute in Puerto Rico, Panama, Atlanta, and Granada, Spain. 
Mr. Pastor's understanding involvement in the community allows him to forge long-standing relationships and innovative programs. In recognition of this, his efforts, in 2009, he was awarded with the title of Cavaliere, the highest honor bestowed by the President of the Republic of Italy. Mr. Pastor has been named Honorary Consul of Italy to Puerto Rico. With that, benvenuti, uh, Consul Pastor, and uh, the next 10, 12 minutes are yours. Vielen Dank, uh, Professor Thiel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to uh, all of your team there at FIU for the wonderful job that you do in, in supporting all efforts of, of our community here in Miami with regards to, to foreign language and institutions such as ours. Um, I, you, you touched a little bit uh, upon uh, where I would like to start in the introduction. Uh, Perhaps, and if you do know the history of the Società Dante Alighieri, please forgive me, but I'd like to go over it uh, very briefly. We were founded in Rome, uh, actually in 1889, uh, during a period of time that, uh, for whatever reason, um, several uh, institutions such as ours in Europe were founded, including the Alliance Française, um, which was founded uh, in 1884. So it seemed to have been a period back then uh, for various reasons in, in European history at that time, that the promotion of the language abroad um, became uh, somewhat uh, of a priority um, for not just Italy, but other European countries. The, the mission, of course, back then was certainly different than it is uh, now, 130 years later, and it was already different when our institution was founded in Miami uh, about uh, 25 years ago. Um, the world has changed, and of course, globalization uh, made the dynamics of, of everything quite different uh, from the 1880s to the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but one, one thing I, I believe remained the same, which of, was, of course, to, to act as a bridge between uh, the, the culture and the language that we represent and the community in which we're located. And that is something that I have, that I have taken very much to heart here in Miami. Um, I always think that there needs to be a distinction and I try to communicate this to, uh, to people in, at least in our foreign ministry in Rome. And whenever I get a chance, I try to convey it to my colleagues in other European countries. I definitely think that of course, for practical reasons, you need to have a country by country strategy. Uh, and of course the, the U.S. is seen by many of our European countries as a monolith and they apply general um, strategies and approaches to the entire country. But I am a strong believer for practical reasons and for reasons that we are all probably aware of, that Miami is not the U.S. when it comes to learning languages. And I think it needs to uh, be dealt with uh, in a special way for all good reasons. And it is from my experience that there is certainly a large number of people in this city that already speak a second language and that have a sensibility to learning perhaps a third language or maybe even a fourth language that you don't find in many other areas of the country for for historical reasons. Miami is a, a, a young city uh, made up mostly of recent immigration, let's say within the past 40 to 50 years. So from that point of view, I really consider our position in this city privileged. And I always, uh, I try to remind this to our students, uh, in, in the Società Dante Alighieri in Miami, when we have beginner students, most of them already speak, for example, a second Romance language, uh, usually Spanish or Portuguese or French. 
And this is a tremendous advantage because it is uh, a fact that if you already know a second language and if you know a second language that is in the, in the same family of languages as is another, in this case, Italian, you will have an advantage and you will potentially learn faster. There are those that argue, and I agree because I see it in the classroom. I like, like my colleague um, uh, Arias at the Spanish consulate. I am a teacher at heart, even though most of my job deals with uh, administration and, and in some cases up until recently consular issues, but I love to teach. So I still try to spend some time in the classroom. I believe that that contact uh, keeps me and gives me a feedback that I am unable to get in any other way. I get a feedback directly from our students and, uh, and from our constituents. And I really enjoy that. And it always helps me uh, keep on top of, uh, of so many things. And one of them is uh, seeing how they definitely have an advantage when it comes to learning a new language. Uh, if they speak, as I was saying before, uh, another Romance language. In, in Miami, well, we were founded um, in 1996, but there was already, since the 1960s, there was some activity with the Società Dante Alighieri in Miami. Uh, but the, the institution changed as as the city change and its demographics change. And our institution in Miami has grown exponentially with uh, the new waves of, uh, of immigration that have come to our city. As you know, Miami has a large population of uh, Latin Americans and what some people might not be aware of, although I know in your field, or at least uh, my colleagues there at FIU, I know you know this, but there are large waves of, of immigrants that have arrived here in the past 20 years, not just of Venezuelans and Brazilians and Argentinians and all other countries in Latin America, but most of these people, or many of these people are Italo-Venezuelans and Italo-Brazilians, Italo-Argentinians. And they have truly, uh, enriched our institution in ways that was not foreseeable when it was first founded here in the city in, uh, in 1996. And the city has also changed tremendously in, in these past 25, 30 years, uh, with many foreign consulates opening in our city. I believe the last time I checked, and I, I'm not sure if it were in third or fourth place, but Miami, I believe, has the third uh, most important diplomatic community in the United States uh, as far as consular presence uh, after New York and Washington, D.C. So this has also benefited us tremendously. And when you look at who our students are and speaking about the message in this, um, in this conference today, Many of our students are diplomats that are posted here in Miami and that in one way or another are expecting to be posted at some future time in Italy and they decide to take our classes. And, and it is fascinating to see how uh, the, the presence of this consular community in Miami has certainly enriched an institution such as ours and how important it is, it goes without saying, to a career diplomat to have the opportunity through uh, the Società Dante Alighieri or similar institutions to continue to learn languages so that their opportunities and uh, continue to widen and doors continue to open as they grow in their profession. The, um, so the students that uh, I referred just, forgive me, to the, to the diplomatic uh, presence and, 
and how that has influenced our student base. Generally, to give you an idea of our students in Miami, uh, we have students really from every single Latin American country, probably 80% uh, of our students to 90% of our students come from uh, Latin America, and then the rest are either North American, and we have uh, some European students from, from every country in Europe, basically, from Germany to Spain, uh, France, and, and, and other countries. Um, and their reasons for taking uh, a language are varied. Uh, some of them take it because they just love the culture and they have an interest in, in learning um, more about this culture. And to touch upon again, what, uh, what my colleague Arias from the uh, uh, Spanish consulate said earlier, which I like very much, was that we always try to convey that learning a language, once you get into it, it's really a lifelong uh, commitment. If you want to do it well, um, I always tell them that the first ingredient has to be, of course, have, studying a language for a profession is wonderful. It's certainly uh, a, uh, an incentive, but the best incentive is to love the culture and to just decide that this is a culture that you want to have in your life for the rest of your life. And as you continue to learn, uh, with our cultures, as we are all aware of, it never ends. It never ends. It never ends with the language. Even as a professor or a teacher, you are constantly learning new aspects or new things, either through the question of a student or through th something that comes up at some sort of a lecture or conference. And uh, our cultures are so rich that it never ends. Uh, it never ends in, 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 in the wealth of information from art to music to history to gastronomy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and a lot of them become lifelong students. And we've had, uh, we have examples at the institution of students that have been studying for 10, 15, some of them 20 years uh, that come and take different classes and uh, not just language, but are, uh, they decide to, uh, to do a lot of our cultural programming, so programming as well. Continue on with uh, last, but certainly not least, with um, Professor Maida Watson, my cherished esteemed colleague at FIU. Uh, Professor Watson, I, I hope you can hear us. Yes, can you hear me? Wonderful, thank you. Let me just okay. quickly introduce you for a second, okay? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Maida Watson, she is a full professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages at F. Florida International University, where she has been a chairperson twice. She has published eight books and over 40 articles in peer-reviewed journals and um, in about the U.S., Latin America, and in Europe, and she published 13 dictionary entries on Latin American literature, teaching Spanish for business, and other topics. She has won over 21 awards and grants from organizations such as the Kaufman Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Italian government, the Florida Endowment for the Humanities uh, and the Arts, as well as the U.S. Office for the Education and the Fulbright's Hayes Program. She's currently presently working on a comparative study of 19th century Latin American costumbrismo, but today she's here to tell us a little bit more about the relevance of um, Spanish, I guess, and language in general, which she knows a lot about in sort of work and other contexts. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Watson. Hi, can you hear me? Good, Fine. Thank you. I am really today representing the C CYBER, the Center for International Business Research which is a, a grant that has been given by the federal, the United States federal government to the College of Business. And its purpose, one of the purposes is to stimulate the learning of languages. So this topic of the relevance, the importance of foreign languages uh, uh, for, for work or for benefits generally is part of our mandate. You know, we've had several seminars and we're planning a couple. In fact, we had one with Lisa. Lisa and I cooperated on a seminar on teaching of, of uh, languages for business for K through 12 teachers. And I was Claudio's boss one time, one, one time when he, uh, and in fact, this morning I made some-, uh, some the, the best boss I ever had. Thank you. 
<laughs> and so, well, so I made some homemade pesto this morning, and I remembered when I had the Italian program over for lunch, and uh, somebody was a vegetarian, and we ended up with three kinds of pesto. So thank you, Claudio, for my recipe, which I made this morning. Now, I am going to give you a presentation that's slightly anecdotal, like Lisa, and then slightly uh, programmatic. As far as anecdotes go, I was brought up in Panama, which is a port, and where the ships go through. And where my husband says everybody in Panama does everything very quickly because they have 24 hours before the next ship comes in. And so he referred in that way to the visits we used to get from relatives in Panama who would come, knock on the door, say hello, uh, see us, and then run out to the next visit, which basically reflected a very close-knit community where you always had to be visiting somebody. So I grew up with the importance that foreign languages had for the workplace. You cannot live in, a, in a, a city like Panama where the canal is, where people are coming from all over the world without realizing the importance of different languages. I grew up speaking Spanish and English. I was told, when that will tell you my age a little bit, when I grew up that French was important. Uh, even though we had a Chinese and Hindu speakers, but it was French. French meant you were a nice, well brought up young lady. And so I went to France and learned French. And then uh, afterwards, uh, when I came to, to Miami and I had two children in addition to being chair of the department for all those years, they promptly, I promptly enrolled them in this program in Sunset Elementary. And I can speak very pr proudly of that program because my daughters complete, and son are completely trilingual. They speak French and uh, they know all the positive and negative aspects of the French culture. So, <laughs> so uh, my daughter went on to become a pediatric allergist, but she still speaks French. And my granddaughter is on the waiting list right now for the German program at Sunset. So uh, there are a lot of different uh, familiar ties to that. Uh, to, in our house, it's very important that you speak foreign languages. My son-in-law comes from a completely different world where foreign languages are not that important. And that's the world that Lisa has had to deal with in her in her uh, different endeavors. Uh, Miami is not the same as the rest of the United States. Like a, a friend of mine said one time, I like living in Miami because it's so close to the United States. And so uh, that is true. And so the, this multicultural variety of people that we have in my, Miami means that you have to look for all kinds of different aspects. For one thing, you have a lot of heritage speakers. And heritage speakers, are some of them are, are frustrated because they think they don't speak proper French or proper Spanish or proper Italian. And yet they do speak it. They speak a variation or a, a, that they can w build on and work upon and become better and better. And so I think we have a tremendous amount of opportunities in the Miami area, not just in the elementary school, but in the culture part. Uh, two days ago, my son-in-law, who's a, 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 a dermatologist and a surgeon and is, in con is in presently in, in culture shock right now because he's been living in Miami during the coronavirus epidemic, said to me, oh, I went to the corner to Uguera Tropical and I ordered in Spanish. They didn't understand me. They had to call somebody from the back of the, of the restaurant to translate for me. He says, that shouldn't be so. And I felt like saying, yes, it should be so. Look at the great opportunity you had. Of course, you didn't understand you because there are all kinds of dialects of Spanish spoken here. And you are not, you know, this doesn't mean that what you spent eight years studying Spanish was a waste of time. It just means that perhaps the people who you were talking to, I couldn't understand either in Spanish, so, at least when I first got to Miami. So we have a tremendous educational advantage and opportunity, and uh, we really have to take advantage of it. There are all kinds of internships in foreign countries. Uh, the Center for International Business Research, Cyber, and the College of Business handle a lot of them, and these, uh, these internships are very useful. You can also do internships right here in Miami with foreign language companies and with consulates. Well, I was chair of a department that half of it is foreign language teachers. Half of them are instructors who teach all kinds of languages. And we've had internships with the Japanese consulate, with uh, all kinds of different consulates. We have a French teacher, Maria Antonieta Garcia, who has, places our students all over. 
And we have a lot of different facilities and things that you can do to improve your languages. So basically I'm saying that if you speak language, Spanish or French or whatever language at home with your grandmother, don't despair. That is not, doesn't mean that you can't learn the other vocabulary and the other things you need in order to speak uh, the kind of Spanish that you might need or French or whatever to do business. And I'll end up with a little anecdote. My son, who is a, a, has his own company, has a, went to the French program. So he speaks fluent French. He, has a, he had a client, uh, an international company, shipping company, for which he prepared some software. When he had lunch with the representatives from France, it's a French-German company, he spoke French all through lunch. Afterwards, when they were doing the bargaining as to what they would the contract would be and what it was, they started French, speaking French to each other. He said, what happened? They didn't realize I could understand every word they were saying. Well, they could not accept the fact that he spoke French with them and that he was able to understand them during the whole thing. So uh, this, this has given my children an advantage, you know, a, a great advantage in the business world. And one is a doctor, the other is a business uh, person, but it does give you an advantage all the time. But the advantage mainly is that you get to see that people are different. You get to see, be inside the brains of other people and you get to realize that there's not just one thing in the world to do. And I finish with this because right now I have my two granddaughters living here. One is five and the other is two. And they like to bang into the middle of the Zoom meetings and say hello to everybody. So I don't want you to have to go through that. So thank you very much. And so you have the... Uh, uh, yep. Thank you. I, I posted the cyber link already um, so that people can check it out. Thank you for your contribution. Um, now, um, Ms. Gephardt, she will continue to hopefully join us to the extent that she can through the chat box. Um, but um, if you have any questions, please. Um, I have a couple of questions. Please um, post them in the Q&A box on the bottom. Um, we have already one from Alison Crummy, and um, it was already answered by Ms. Gephardt for uh, the, from the French side, but Alison asks, um, aside from teaching assistant opportunities that are mentioned in here, are there any programs that can be tailored to certain professional fields? Um, and I similar had the question, how well do these, you know, for example, Alison is an international relations uh, student, probably interested in diplomatic, you know, sort of language training programs. Um, do you know from your country of any other programs? And in general, that was my question, if I can add that to Alison's, how well do these um, language training programs that you have in your countries, right, the teaching assistant programs, how well do they fit into the career path of people who do not want to necessarily become teachers later on, right? Or language specialists, but want to do something entirely different. If anyone wants to take that. Yes, if I may, if I may address that, I just want to say that um, being a language assistant provides a wonderful opportunity for people who are interested in pursuing a career in teaching. But as I said in the presentation, it's not only teaching. Um, this, is a, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn a language, to experience that language, to experience that culture, and then you can take that with you into any other field, field that you're interested in pursuing. Someone, I would definitely recommend an LCAP program to somebody who's interested in international relations, because you have to learn um, uh, being in the classroom, being in a new culture. There's a lot of things that you have to learn, and you're going to get great soft skills and, and, and other skills, the language skills, obviously, um, to pursue a career in absolutely any field. Well, if I may add to... Um, I'd like to, to what, add to after Claudio. Well, I would just like to, I would like to uh, say that I think that in any field, and, and this has been talked about already for many years, uh, you do need a certain amount of cultural sensitiv sensitivity, and Maida alluded to that with the anecdote about her son and business. I think when you have an understanding of the culture that you have before you in any situation, whether it's as a diplomat or as a business person, you're going to have an advantage. You're going to you're going to be able to communicate with that person either in business or in diplomacy 
with an advantage if the person that you are uh, having to work with beside you doesn't have that advantage. So that's just what I wanted to comment. Please, Maida, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to, okay, first I wanted to say that I think the programs that the Spanish government has are fantastic because you get a full year of being out of your comfort zone. In other words, it doesn't matter what they do. You are there for one year, usually living in some little town in Spain. I know because several of my students have been on that program. And it doesn't matter that they are that you're being a teaching assistant. What you're learning is how, what happens at uh, 2 o'clock, who goes to the, to the local bar, what the people do, what they think. And for 10 years, I took students to Salamanca one summer and I had them live with families. And the students would always say to me, Dr. Watson, why don't you put us up at a hotel? Why don't you put us up at a hotel where we can all get drunk together and jump out of the window and do all kinds of fun things like that? Why are you such a spoil sport? Why are we living with all these families and eating greasy sausages or something like that? And I said, because tomorrow you might be wanting to sell refrigerators or stoves to Spaniards and at least you know how they think. You, you have to do this. You have to suffer a little bit. You have to get out of your comfort zone. Everything isn't all organized. And this is why you, I have you in families, which I worked really hard to put together, instead of in the local hotel. So, in fact, one summer we had them in a, in a monastery and they flooded the water. They turned the tap on and flooded the whole fourth floor. And the priest... I ran into him by accident five years later, and he says to me, Watson, you're the one with those horrible students, you know? And so, so you know, this, this, this was, I was putting a damper on them because what they really, there was no way that you could have just a language experience where you don't suffer, where you don't have a little bit of discomfort. And honestly, I don't care whether the programs in Spain are well-organized or disorganized or chaotic or whatever. The point is you're getting paid for one year, a stipend and, and medical insurance to go immerse. And you're not going to learn the language if you don't immerse, if you don't suffer a little bit. So I, having suffered through several uh, you know, language experiences, would like to share that with you. Thank you so much. So really what you all are saying is it's not only about sort of instrumental language learning, right? It is really about acquiring intercultural communication skills as well. That's sort of the added uh, benefit. Um, now, please, um, for the participants, please continue to post any questions you may have. Um, I'll move on in the meantime to some questions that I took note that I also get asked as an international relations professor um, all the time. So let's start with the uh, one about how to describe your own language abilities. I think that is something that many people would want to know. You know, when I see resumes from students, I see different classifications, right? Some are very strict and they say, you know, I don't know, A level one, because that's sort of what their cultural or their language institute says. And the other ones just use sort of basic, intermediate, advanced, and I think, uh, what is it, native or near native. Is there like a golden rule? Should they always uh, check back with the language institute? Is there is there like a standard rule of how to describe in CVs or in interviews um, your level of language proficiency? Well, I, I believe that, that being obviously representing a European language, I support the European uh, structure of A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. It's very clear if you're a language professional what those levels mean. It's not just grammar knowledge, it's also you need to prove uh, spoken and oral knowledge at that level. And uh, I prefer to see that in a resume, especially if you're referring to a European language, even if you are an American saying that you speak Italian at that level, I think if you're gonna say you speak Italian or French or German, you should use the European levels because that's, the clearest and most defined, certainly more than beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Um, I, I would like to say that I agree with Claudio and the, the levels of the European, uh, the common framework um, are excellent levels. They've been tried out for many years because in Europe, the importance of language learning is, is so significant, so significant. However, I have found that many times Americans 
um, do not have a knowledge of, of, of that system. So I would also recommend, especially if it's here in the United States, um, you could put the, the levels from the European framework, but also the ACTful um, levels, which um, go a little bit more in depth than beginner, intermediate, and, and native, but uh, most people in, in, the, in the United States are more familiar with the app. Great. Can I uh, add on to that? Um, the question from Adrian Bustos, who asked, how does one find out in which level one is in from A1 to C2? Well, again, I can speak for the Società d'Antialighieri. Uh, there are, in, in all of our countries, at least certainly uh, uh, Italy, France, and Germany, there are state-sponsored exams, either through an institution such as the Società d'Antialighieri or the Alliance Francaise or the Goethe, all of those institutions have the ability to certify your level uh, based on the European uh, standards uh, through exams, uh, and in some cases, even at a distance. Especially in this past year with the pandemic, I, I've seen flexibility uh, extending to doing things online to certify your level. Yes, totally agree. Um, Spain has the DELE exams, which are actually administered here uh, in the United States through El Instituto Cervantes. And um, they're also um, offered in, in a, a network of schools that we have, we call them International Spanish Academies. There are ESA schools, we have over 130, and they're also administered in those schools um, to uh, show the level of Spanish that these students have. So oh, these are these. Uh, there's also CLE and there's also CLE, which are more um, directed at um, taking them um, online rather than the DELE that are more um, present in the schools. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Alexandra Reyes in the chat in the Q and A box, and she asks, "I will be enrolling in the German." language and culture certificate that is offered at FIU. And she's wondering, what are some of the tips to retain language information while taking other classes besides studying? Because she believes it's easy to fall off track, right? Particularly if it's not a common language, you know, the people around someone speak. And, you what? know, I mean, I, I can just very quickly from my own uh, thing, I can say that I have a similar issue, so I can totally relate to Alexandra's question. Um, I, I don't know, I watch Netflix movies um, or shows, right? They have Netflix or online, you know, streaming service have great European shows. And so I usually do the original language, you know, with the subtitles on um, to keep me somewhat engaged. Um, but, you know, this is an issue, it's an issue to keep those, to retain the information, if to use it. What uh, other options are there available? Thank you. Well, I can just say, Marcus, I, I completely agree with you because I get that feedback from our students all the time. It seems that Netflix and a lot of uh, programs on Amazon Prime, more than ever before, because before I remember we, went, we had to look for foreign films or, or it was much more difficult and it seems to, to be more and more, thanks to technology, more ease, it's becoming easier for a lot of our students uh, at all levels to have material easily accessible that they can listen to or watch. And I hear Netflix all the time mentioned either through series or programs or films. So that is a great resource. Can I say something? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can, yes. I have a five-year-old granddaughter who's completely bilingual in Spanish and she she watches cartoons in Spanish all the time and she comes up to me with vocabulary that I don't even know what the word is I have to look it up on my iPhone because she her parents are terrified that she's watching to television so they let her watch it only and it's only available in Spanish so she knows how to go to Netflix and put on the Spanish part which is she knows otherwise is going to be taken off the screen and she can't watch it at all and it is amazing the amount of vocabulary that she has. I mean, she asked me the other day about my atuendo. That's the word she used for my, she says, Don't, where is my atuendo to play tennis? She meant her tennis clothes. And I'm thinking, my God, I haven't used that word in a million years. So I really go for Netflix. You could watch Babylonia Berlin in its original German. Uh, I watched it with my husband, who's a 
uh, international relations professor, and he gave me every detail about pre World War II Berlin. You know, and so uh, I knew exactly when the communists were going to come in and when the Nazis were going and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not keeping up German because I watched it in English. But anybody who would want to, if you do, if you just click on to their language and you do the subtitles, it takes a little bit of technical skills. You could do that. And as for Spanish, you could always watch the telenovelas. But then, you know, you might end up talking like them, too. So... <laughs> There's, there's no doubt about it that technology has really brought another dimension to language learning and to keeping up um, with languages. I'd also like to say that listening to music is a great way because um, what Claudia was saying before, I remember having to, in Spain, listen to a song in English and write down all the words, all the lyrics, and then give it to give it to my students. And now we just have to, you know, uh, search for the lyrics and, and, and there it is. So music, definitely. I, I also remember uh, once I had in a classroom, I had, um, it was a, a, a beginner, almost beginners, a little bit higher than beginner level class. And I had a, a student whose English was excellent. And I said, where, you know, where did you learn this English? Did you live abroad in an English speaking country? And he said, no, I love basketball. I love the NBA. So I listen to, I, I watch all these games. And because of that, again, tied to the movies and all of that, um, that's how he, he learned English. And I want to say that my, my two oldest children learned English watching Friends. The whole 10 seasons of Friends, one summer, they just saw all the episodes. And, and that, that's really a great way to teach your, your language skills, no doubt about it. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question coming in from in the few minutes that we have. Um, by Ellie Jackman, and she says, thank you for the interesting presentations. I've noticed that when a native French or Dutch speaker speaks English, French or Dutch speaker speaks English, that adverbs or adjectives are used more conservatively and seem to carry greater emphasis than is common with you as English speaker, though this may be abstract. Um, how would you describe the significance in learning the culture-specific aspect of communication when learning another language? So how significant is the, are the culture specific aspects of communication? I mean, we had talked a little bit about this before, right? That it's more than just simple language learning, but I don't know if there are some details about the cultural. Uh, well, I, I, I would suggest as I do in many situations in life in general, to observe before you speak. And this I apply not only to language learning, but in general. Just observe, you know, observe uh, before you, you begin to speak or observe the behavior of the people that you're about to interact with. And you can learn a lot just from that. It is a fact that um, uh, American English is prone to superlatives and to, you know, adjectives much more than we might be in some of our European languages. So, I think that as an American learning a European language, you know, we don't really use the word fabulous or fantastic or wonderful or uh, words like that as often, as often. So, and that's just one example of many others. Um, so yes, just observe and observe the behavior of others and also the interaction of others. As we know, even before the pandemic, um, Europeans, tend to be, of course, not Italians, but a lot of Europeans tend to be much less physical, much less touchy with one another than maybe Americans might be or Italians might be. Uh, so that's another aspect. Um, and as an Italian, I have been aware of this for a long time. My nature is to give you a hug and to give you two kisses, one on each cheek. But in America- I quickly, not anymore, my not anymore. I, we learned that in the past 12 months, but even before that, I was learning that, you know, uh, you just have to, that's not what you do in many circumstances, even though in Italy, it might be perfectly acceptable. Yes, and again, if you watch movies or if you watch shows, it's a great way to point out the cultural differences also. You see holidays being celebrated. You see what, what Claudia was saying about, 
greeting someone. There's so many, there's so many um, aspects that you can see in this kind but that of- leads me, uh, That resources. leads me back just momentarily. I just want to make emphasis on what I touched upon very, very briefly and Maida discussed that too. Miami is really a total, a different planet when it comes to that in the US. I think our behavior system here is much more uh, Latin in many ways, just because of the nature of the community itself. So, um, you know, you also have to be sensitive if you're talking about learning the culture and the language here in this city, uh, you also have to pay attention to the fact that this city is really different uh, even than other big cities in the US when it comes to that. Thank you. Um, I have, um, I think we have time for at least one more question and Denny Taro asked a question that I can relate to. Um, if you're a person who has studied other languages and plans to continue doing so, what do you think is the most difficult aspects of getting a strong foundation in this other new language um, when learning it, even if you already speak one more than uh, one? And I can very well relate to that because, you know, um, my Italian wasn't that bad because we always vacationed in Italy. And then I started learning Spanish. And whenever I try now to speak Italian, Spanish comes out. So there's this kind of overlap of related languages going on. So I think, Danny, I'm not sure you that's what you were going for, but maybe some of you can say how to, I don't know, get a strong foundation in another, particular if it's a closely related language or conversely, a totally different language. Well, I would say, you know, maybe it's easy to say grammar, but I don't agree with that totally. And going back to the NALCAP program, I think having a strong foundation in listening and in speaking skills hearing that native speaker, native-like speaker in the classroom, I think that's fundamental as a, as a strong foundation for learning a language. I think, I, I, I think Danny might be actually one of our students in our German programs, I, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, I just think that trying to expose yourself, it's almost an obvious thing to say, it, it is, just expose yourself as much as possible to listening. Try to find, we all have interests, you know, generally common interests are either history or art or as, or, um, or music. Uh, gastronomy is a very strong interest for a lot of people. I think that sometimes if you find a niche that really you're passionate about in your culture that you are just beginning to learn, that is a great incentive to learn even more, even though at the beginning, it's just that niche. It might be the food of a place or the history of a place or a specific period of time in art or specific type of movies or music. Um, I think being exposing yourself constantly to something like that, that enriches you not, linguist, not just linguistically, but also just your general knowledge of, of the culture is a great way a great way to go. Um, you know, I can speak from my experiences. I learned a little bit of German, which I have never forgotten as a young man, because I was in Germany. I fell in love with so many things about the culture. Um, and that has always stayed with me. The little French that I know was just from watching. I would fall in love with these French uh, movies and I would watch them again and again and again. Uh, and I would just learn that way. So you have to find something that you, even though it's obvious, it's almost such an obvious thing to say, but it's, it's true. You have to find something that you love, not just the language, but even more uh, about the culture and just go with that. May I say something? Okay. I, I, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I just want to say that if you're learning a language unhappily, you cannot be too anal. You cannot be the kind of person who has to have everything exactly the way it should be. 
because there is no way and I tell this to the language teachers, there is no way people will say, well, you didn't put that. I, I have to learn these words and I don't know if they're going to go on the final exam or or what, what you're never a language is so complex and so complicated. That there's always something you're going to have to need to learn. So you have to forget about your language anxiety and, and, and having everything just right. And I, when I first was hired by FIU, my students were all the faculty because they had a program to teach Spanish to the faculty. The worst ones were the PhDs in physics and in chemistry because they wanted the language to be like a formula. You know, they wanted to, to take the words and they changed them around so that they were, and it doesn't, that doesn't work. So you actually will never completely learn a language. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, since we're basically, yeah, we're getting close to, to the end time, um, I'm, I wanted to know if there are some final words you want to, each of us want to, each of you want to give. If not, I, I would just want to thank you very much and also our tech service and Christine. Is there, are there any final words, any last minute urgent <laughs> recommendations, the one thing you should be doing when uh, trying to learn a language? No. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think we had a very, for me, I thought it was a very stimulating, I hope for many of you, for all of you, this was a stimulating experience. Please fill out the survey that I posted in the chat box. And once again, I want to thank you all. Uh, uh, Ms. Gephardt, I'm so sorry that for the technical issues. Uh, we tried our best, um, but you can find all also our, our informations on our website, uh, miamiuc.com. FIU.edu. That should be the right one. Uh, Google Miami EU Center and you'll find it. And um, please keep out watching for additional um, programming that we have coming up, miamiuc.fiu.edu. Um, thank you very much for being here today. And uh, thanks for our panelists. Thanks to our tech staff and to Christine. Thank you very much. Take care and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Bonsoir.